I've heard Brianna speak of complicated grief. What do we do to heal complicated grief? Where do we begin? I get stuck in my emotions and, and past losses, and I sense that the losses, I have something to do with a lack of attachment to my true self or an ability to process grief because of the emptiness due to a lack of attachment to, a, to an essential self. Can you explain this to me? Okay, so I love this question because I came to this through the exact same process. So I had an experience in my life where there's just a confluence of things that happened. It was loss of my job, heartbreak and loss of relationship, miscarriage, my mom had cancer, and all of these things happened at the same time. And so I originally felt like I'm going through a grief process because I've had a lot of different losses that are shaking up my relationships and my sense of, of security here. And so I started researching a lot about grief and that led me to complicated grief, which is a prolonged experience of grief that doesn't abate with treatments for depression, for example. Um, and, and that there's a sense of clinging to our, um, our grief in a way. It's almost like we're addicted to the feeling. And I found parallels to the relationships that I would be in. And so while a lot of the literature speaks about bereavement specifically and, and death, I was noticing that in my experience, I was having these similar feelings and they were connected to maybe not the death of someone, but they were connected to like identity losses that were tied up in my relationships. So when we don't have a real connection to our sense of self and what it is that we want and what it is that lights us on fire and 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 that and believe that it is okay if we're not necessarily in romantic partnership and that we can still be on fire about life even if we're not in romantic partnership then you are susceptible i believe to something called complicated grief the sort of unabated feeling of grief and so i did a lot of research i fell down a research rabbit hole i went from grief to complicated grief to attachment and they have found there's lots of neuroscientific research out there that talks about how our experience of complicated grief lives in the same part of the brain as attachment. And they did a study, specifically uh, Mary O'Connor did a study in 2008, and they looked at mothers, women, um, sisters who had lost uh, another family member, and this, this was a bereavement study. But they looked at the women who kind of met a criteria for complicated grief, which means they had prolonged, unabating symptoms of grief. And then they looked at the women who had met the criteria for what we'll call non-complicated grief. So meaning that the grief process was allowing them to ultimately integrate the experience and, and move on. So it wasn't impacting their ability to function on an everyday level. It wasn't necessarily over time, the pain was abating and they were able to step into a more positive sense of self and worldview and to con continue going about their daily activities in a way that didn't necessarily impair their quality of life. Whereas those that had the more complicated grief experience would still, you know, maybe they could function, but they maybe they're have crying spells all the time, repetitive, perseverative, preoccupied thoughts about the loss, um, you know, clinging to the loss, and but they might cycle through being cutting off all any and all connection to and discussion of it, being unable to talk about it, and then swing into being full on, you know, preoccupied with it and engaged with the with it. And so I felt like that was very similar to this this process of being in an addictive, anxious, avoidant, a trap cycle um, was my feeling about it and they had in the neuroscientific research showed that for people who had complicated grief both their pain and pleasure related pathways would light up around the subject of the loss for people who had what i'm going to call non-complicated grief only their pain pathways lit up so if you can imagine we are we are what's the word organized wired to move towards pleasure and away from pain. But if you've had an experience where pain and pleasure were wired together, you know, uh, neuroscientists call this neurons that fire together, wire together, then that becomes the, the experience that, that becomes what we know of experience. So if in your brain you have attached um, to someone and you have identified them as being essential to your mental, emotional, and biological survival, and there is a level of pain associated with that attachment, that's what you are going to understand as being necessary to your survival. That is what you are going to understand as being true love.
And then you're going to, then your mind, your conscious mind, your limiting beliefs, all of that is going to assign an egoic attachment to that process. And so it's a twofold thing. You've got a body attachment to it. The behavioral cycles and mechanisms that are now stored in your limbic system and amygdala are now all saying, this person is essential to my survival. And I'm going to, every other story and or narrative and or belief that I have is going to rewrite itself to accommodate that belief. And so it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. Did that happen first or did that happen first? My opinion is that it, it probably happened more or less simultaneously because I approach this from a psycho-spiritual perspective. So let's explain this in terms of the five uh, doshas or koshas of Ayurvedic tradition. So I approach this from the perspective that we all have uh, an essential self, an inner being, um, the true self or aspect of ourselves that we come to discover through play, through interacting with people in our lives, through the contrast that we experience in life. And when we're children, we we come from, we, we, we learn about ourselves by butting up against our environment, right? And so that's why when we talk about optimal environments as producing secure attachment and, it, you know, let's say, non-optimal environments as producing insecure attachment because all of that comes to help us form our sense of self and identity and so if we've grown up in non-optimal environments when we become adults it becomes a process of reparenting ourselves and creating the conditions in which we can step into our fullest circumference from a more secure place now because that's such an interesting path and and that is a path that has a lot of contrast tied up in it i believe that if you struggle with insecure attachment then you actually come from a place of great calling. Um, so, so, and the way things manifest in the world, I believe is through vibration and harmony and energy. So you can imagine this is your corporal form, okay? So then there will be, I know I'm not gonna be able to recite them all from memory, but there's this idea that, that there's your corporal form, but that your energetic bodies extend beyond the corporal form and they have these different layers. So you could imagine that, um, so this might be, so then there's, so there's like ether, okay? So ether would just be like whatever it is that the, 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 the uh, sort of like the air, you know, it's just like whatever it is that's flowing through the air, life force energy, whatever you want to call it, is like ether. It's just pure potential. Then maybe that becomes air. Then maybe we have uh, let's say steam, then maybe steam becomes water, and then water becomes ice. Okay, so you can see that there are these increasing layers of density, and your energy has a similar process. So there's increasing layers of density. So let's say that you have, so this is what we talk about when we talk about like um, psychosomatic complaints and experiences. Anxiety is very much an embodied experience. Actually, anxiety is qualified by your bodily symptoms, sweaty palms, um, butterflies in your stomach, uh, headaches, um, you know, uh, jumpy, jittery feeling in your body. You know, it's, that's what qualifies that experience. So if you could imagine when we talk what, what we're doing right now in terms of talking about things, being in therapy, um, exploring these things on an emotional level. So the body will kind of start to tell you when the, that emotive stuff, let's say is kind of in the water, maybe a little bit of the steam layer, when that stuff is starting to become ice. So now it's becoming more dense. So if you've got a lot of stress going on, but you're ignoring it or you're pushing it down or you're repressing it or you're not listening to the cues of your body and you just keep going, 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 going until you get sick, that's because all of that has been calcifying and now it's become the density of ice. Now it has moved into your body. And at this point, it's gonna require a different level of intervention than if you were to do it here. So let's say you have that high level of stress in your relationships, at jobs, work, whatever, and you decide, I'm gonna go see a healer, I'm gonna go see a therapist, I'm gonna go see someone and start to talk about this. So it doesn't get to the point where it's become so much embodied, then then that's obviously a different layer of intervention, okay? So this is like, this is kind of sometimes speaks to that um, debate that sometimes goes on, I think in spiritual communities where they talk about, well, you know, law of attraction, if you can, um, 
if if you know sickness is really just a manifestation of your focus or your thoughts then just think different thoughts and it will get better that is a very um, surface level and to some extent ignorant interpretation of what's going on that once it has reached the body level you have to be you have to be engaging with the body and so kind of like this whole I think illusory split between Eastern medicine and Western medicine which is illusory to begin with they're both good and they're both doing what they need to do but but I think it's better to think of them as working in tandem okay um, and also even this notion of uh, that spirituality being a separate from psychology also illusory especially when you consider the foundations of most of our psychology comes from psychoanalysis and, and Freud at least as we understand it now and a lot of what he has come up with is primarily sourced from the Kabbalah and Ayurvedic traditions so um, if you want to learn more about that, I would recommend uh, reading anything by Michael, Michael Egan. Um, but so a lot of the divisions and separate, separate notions we have about things are very much illusory, especially when it comes to what we're talking about in health and medicine and healing and all of that. Um, but to get back to this question, get speaking to to complicated grief experience and how as it connects to love and relationships it is a little death so when you break up with someone and you've had this kind of attachment to them it is in essence a death you are mourning the loss of whatever the nature of that connection was and i do believe that you know there's this process that a lot of people do particularly in esoteric communities but they talk about cords that we are connected you know through cords and that we need to cut the cords and let that person go you're always connected to everyone we are always connected to everyone and I do believe in that process of cutting cords but understand that when you cut that cord it will grow back but it will grow back in a new and different way and you may need to cut it a hundred times until it gets to the place where you need it to grow back so that you are able to more fully step into your circumference in a way that affects Mm, the quality of life that you are in your heart of hearts desiring okay but even that's not bad that's just a part of the process and and how can you be on fire about life while in process right that's about that's really what I how I would define a sense of security is to be on process about to be in process and on fire about that process as you're in process so there isn't like this is touching a little bit upon a previous question we, we responded to, but it isn't like you're going to meet this marker, this standard of security, and now you can step into that happily ever after you were ever dreaming of. People who have been happily married for 30 years are going to tell you, if that's your fantasy, you're in for a rude awakening. <laughs> because there's always work. There's always contrast. There's always this butting up against each other in different ways. But it's kind of like a dance. If you can both hold your own access, in a way and connect then 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 the dance will flow much more easily and beautifully right now to speak to complicated grief I arrived at talking about love and relationships because it was my experience of complicated grief that brought me here and it was my observation and opinion that it was in fact the same process that would heal comp I mean using this because I heal is heal is a word that has a certain connotation to it but let's say um, brings you into more fullest residence within yourself it's the same process and that is a connecting to the self and understanding that the self is abiding and lasting and thriving at any given moment and that you are in to some degree the thing that you can control is the way you perceive receive and respond to your experience and and that means that if you can have a deeper connection to the essential self going through the processes that we talk about and explore in this group um, and you know and through my online programs then you start to it's a practice it's learning that it's learning that you don't you don't only live in this concrete world of physical form you don't only live in that world you also live in this world there's a world inside of you that's going on concurrently and and to some extent we're trained out of developing that world at a young age and to my mind you know, sometimes there are methods of dealing with things like trauma or going back and working with experience around loss that mean you have to relive the loss in order to to, to see yourself surviving it and integrating it and 
I think that's okay. I think it's true to an extent. But I think sometimes we don't have to go, we don't have to be so heavy handed with it. You know, like sometimes it's like cutting butter with a machete. We just have to go back to where that process was cut off. And that means that we just have to learn how to play because this process was natural to us as children. And if you look at the way children play and explore and dive into things, they're on fire about life, most of them, until it's bred out of them and until it's conditioned out of them. And so really it goes back to being playful and being able to access that part of you. And, you know, I think John Bradshaw's work is really wonderful and seminal in that, you know, he introduced this notion of the wounded inner child. And it really is a process of, of connecting to the part of you that kn remembers and knows how to play. Okay. Um, so so to, to, to answer that question about complicated grief, everything, actually everything that I've created online stems from what I felt was a way to process complicated grief. And now I package it in the form of romantic relationship because that was how complicated grief found me. But I believe that this is something that pertains to all forms of loss. And I would, I would venture to say additionally traumatic experience. Um, so I'm gonna stop answering that question there because I could go off on trauma, but I wanna make sure I address everything. <laughs>